coming up next, we focus in on Southeast Asia as we try to get an insider's perspective of fundraising and exit activities. Now, with the globalizing capital markets, Southeast Asian companies have access to an increasing amount of channels. We hear key operators take on what the best options are and how to successful companies have navigated this landscape. Moderating this next panel, Jean-Claude Donato, managing partner of Nikaya Ventures. The panel of ex experts consists of Trade Gecko's Cameron Priest, Eric Barbier, founder of Transfer2, Wavecell co-founder and CEO Olivier Gerhardt, and Stas Protasov, co-founder and technology president of Acronis. Let's now join Jean-Claude and the panel of experienced founders to hear more about Southeast Asian fundraising and exit options. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this panel, uh, Insider's Perspective on ASEAN Founders Going Global for Growth, Fundraising and Exit. Uh, so I'm Jean-Claude Donato, the Managing Director of uh, Nikai Ventures, uh, growth consulting and advisory firm based in Singapore helping a uh, technology company to uh, go regional, global, and, and raise money uh, from uh, global investors. Um, we have today uh, four panelists. Uh, I will let them uh, introduce themselves. Uh, we can start with uh, Stas first. Uh, hi, guys. My name is Stanislav Kratasov. I am one of the founders and uh, currently serving as technology president for Acronis. Acronis was founded back in 2003 here in Singapore. And currently we are a global company, dual headquartered. Our second headquarter is in Switzerland. Uh, we are a software company and leader in cyber protection. We sell our products in over than 150 countries. We have uh, around uh, half a million business customers and uh, more than 5 million prosumers. And we have offices in 33 countries in the world and we localize our product into more than uh, 40 languages. Thank you, Stas. Uh, uh, Oliver, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Yes, hi. So, uh, Olivier Gerhardt, uh, I'm the founder and ex CEO of WebCell, uh, a company I started in 2010 in Singapore, a communication platform as a service addressing the uh, enterprise uh, space and market uh, for, uh, and, and focused on, on, on uh, Southeast Asia. Um, so, I grew the, the business from 2010 to uh, 2019. Uh, mainly uh, focusing on five, six countries, Singapore, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, um, and uh, Hong Kong, uh, scaling the business up to uh, 100 people today. Uh, raised uh, my Series A uh, in 2014-15. After a few years, uh, the company was initially self-funded, uh, and we grew the business. Uh, it was profitable. We decided to raise the Series A to scale further in 2015 and uh, raise our Series B in 2017 up to uh, the exit uh, of a trade sale. So I sold web sale uh, in 2019 um, to a US-based company called 8x8, uh, New, York Stock, New York Stock Exchange listed company for $125 million. Um, and uh, since 2019, um, basically, I've been also, I've been scaling the, the same business, uh, the communication platform as a service, um, for it by it uh, globally, um, still based in Asia. Uh, so basically, we help our customers, enterprise customers, to better communicate with the user on mobile using uh, one of our communication channels: SMS, video, uh, chat, um, and voice. Right, uh, Cameron? Hi, I'm uh, Cameron Priest, the CEO, ex CEO, and co founder of Tregeco. Uh, Tregeco was an inventory and auto management platform. We launched it in uh, Singapore in 2013. We actually built global from day one. So we were always serving the global markets, um, US being our largest market, Australia, Canada, uh, so on and so forth. We raised around $20 million in total from both Singapore and Australian investors. And we exited to uh, 
US-based company called Intuit, around 100 million US about 12 weeks ago. Thank you and congratulations, Cameron and Olivier. Uh, Eric? Yeah, I'm Eric Barbier. I'm the CEO currently of AAA, a crypto payment gateway. Um, before that, I started two companies, one called Mobile365, uh, headquarter in the US, uh, which raised uh, $70 million uh, and which we sold uh, in 2006 uh, to Sybase, uh, a publicly listed company. Uh, which now belongs to SAP. And, uh, and I also started a company called Transfer2 uh, out of Singapore in 2007, uh, which I sold for the second time uh, uh, two years ago to a private equity fund. And before that, I sold it first to a, uh, um, a publicly listed company called Ingenico uh, doing payment terminal. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everyone. Uh... So I propose we jump on the first uh, topic for the day. Uh, so uh, I suppose that, you know, since all of you have actually scaled operation globally, have, you know, uh, raised money uh, uh, overseas or even exited to overseas companies, uh, you probably have faced a lot of challenges while going global. Um, would you like to uh, share a bit more about uh, these challenges? I think we can start with uh, Stas first. Okay, I, I would talk probably a little bit about why software companies has to be global. It's quite simple. First of all, for software companies, it's uh, very easy to go global. Uh, the logistics to deliver your products is trivial. And uh, you basically uh, target much bigger market. Uh, for example, Singapore, where we are founded, is about uh, 0.4% of uh, world GDP, and as such, uh, targeting less than a percent of uh, the potential market makes no sense. When you scale software business, uh, uh, actually depending on the function, the approach could be different. For example, in sales, it's always help us to find the local partner in the country we are going into, start working with them, and if the market develops very well, it's a good idea to acquire this uh, local partner. That happened actually with us, with our first partners in Europe, particularly in Germany and such countries. Then you can actually start building global sales. And uh, when you have enough presence, you know how to deal with it. But when you scale your R&D, your engineering force, it's a little bit different approach. Unfortunately, in R&D, if you build something from scratch, you lose all the expertise which you had before. And that's becoming kind of between uh, art and uh, quite uh, tedious job uh, to build a new R&D center. First of all, you definitely need to get local uh, people because that's exactly the reason why you are building uh, a new area in this center to get an access to wider pool of talent. But at the same time, you need to somehow transfer the expertise. And as such, uh, you will run into all cultural issues. And that's the most difficult thing to handle. You have to understand how to basically uh, marry different cultures. Nonetheless, you will still have the issues, but uh, it's manageable. I have plenty of examples of different uh, mentality and so on and so forth. But uh, keep in mind, any operation which requires uh, expertise from your home country, that operation would be difficult to scale. But the faster you start, the better you will master it. Make sense? Yeah, makes sense. So I think on, on that topic, Eric, you also have scaled, uh, you know, your past uh, uh, two companies, the current company across uh, almost, uh, you know, uh, dozens of countries across the globe. Uh, did you face the same uh, challenges in terms of like people, culture, talents, and, uh, you know, localizing the products, especially I know you're, uh, you're an expert of emerging markets like Africa, Latin, uh, and Middle East. Uh, would you like to share a bit more about uh, your, uh, your perspective? Yeah, for us, because, you know, transfer to uh, is doing cross-border uh, transactions. So by definition, we have to be global. Um, and, 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 and most of the most of our business 
was going from developed countries to uh, to emerging countries. So, so some of the challenges uh, we had to deal with is how to be um, uh, to comply with uh, with the local regulation and understand the local culture. So, giving you an example, uh, in order to send money to Bangladesh, uh, you need to uh, get um, the local uh, central bank to agree uh, and to approve you. Uh, so, so in order to do that, uh, you, you know, you usually to have to have either uh, you know local people or um, or, or local partners uh, in, in order to help you with, with that. Because especially in in emerging countries, you know, uh, you know, uh, another example where uh, you know we, we we hire someone in Kenya to uh, take care of the uh, of the whole uh, East Africa region. Uh, that was really essential. To, um, to, you know, to, to, to be able to expand the business. On the other hand, the challenge we had with hiring so many people from so, so many different backgrounds, uh, it was, was a lot of uh, miscommunication between, between the team uh, as, as the culture was um, you know, really different and, and people. So one of the things I, I was able, to, you know, back then we were lucky, we, we could still travel, uh, but you know, what I was trying to do as much as possible is for people to meet uh, face to face um, uh, with each other, so so that you know that, that's how we kind of solve this issue. Great, uh, Stas, well, and we can also. Do you feel uh, also that was your biggest challenge uh, you had in the past five years or ten years uh, of your uh, going global journey? To extent, yeah, uh, I, I, I would agree with this, uh, Oliver. Yeah, Eric, too. Same. Anything to add on that? Um, I think going global. I think the uh, so starting from Singapore, uh, I would say, or, or or in my previous company, starting from uh, from France and the, the the challenging country, the country where you have to treat differently, is the U.S. Uh, so my advice, you know, to to any company is that you know one of the founder of the, you know the CEO has to go to the U.S. The, you know, if you're just hiring a couple of sales guy, even even if they're pretty senior, they are gonna have a hard time to explain to you how you need to tweak your product uh, in the right way for the local market. My experience in in both cases um, is that we had to tweak a bit the product, whether it was SMS back then and US was not really uh, uh, ahead of its time uh, for SMS. When it was, uh, you know, money transfer, the way it was being sold, and, and the importance of the U.S. to Mexico corridor, uh, even though you, you can read about it and, and so on, but my my experience uh, was really, if you want to be successful in the U.S., you really need to have some people of the funding team uh, to go there to, you know, uh, because otherwise you, you will not, you know, it's it like. Even though everybody is using 220 volts around the world, you know, in the US you have 110, and 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 sometimes it's not so easy to understand why your product is not working. It's just because of a simple thing. So you know that's why we we kind of screw up a bit in the, in the US for uh, for for my first uh, for mobile 365, um, and uh, you know and what I did for transfer two is I actually moved to the US uh, in 2010. For, uh, for for a couple of years there to really set up the and set up the team and, and get the first clients and and now the US is 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 the uh, transfer to largest market. That's interesting. Uh, Cameron, I think it's a good transition because if I remember correctly, uh, um, US was your largest market, right? Uh, and also in Tweet is also is into the largest market. Uh, tell tell us more about how you entered the US uh, quite early, I, I think, right? Yeah, I mean, we um, we served uh, the US and, to be honest, any market um, from day dot. I think um, kind of building on what everyone else said, though, I think the most difficult thing was aligning leadership across markets because when you have what we had, which was a very large team in Singapore and a smaller team in Toronto and not in the US, just um, executives want to feel like they're part of the decision-making framework. And obviously, the, the standard way things happen is U.S. companies and, you know, local teams feel like they're never listened to. Well, in our case, kind of the reverse happened, which is we had the, U the Singapore headquarters and the U.S. team who never really felt like they were getting, you know, what they thought they, they needed to, to drive success in the North American market. So even though it was our largest market, um, I kind of build on what everyone else said. No one really felt like 
we were probably kind of achieving what we could have. Um, and I think we didn't do it, but yes, we needed to get there. Um, now with Intuit, um, we're seeing the inverse again, which is Intuit is so focused on the US and the rest of the world, to be frank, is less um, less important, at least today, to their, their, their business, but it is a growth area. Um, so we're kind of seeing how decisions are made in one place and teams in other places uh, trying to understand how they can drive it, imports and changes and you know obviously get their opinions heard. That's great. I think we can go now to the, thanks everyone for all your perspective on the challenges of going global. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great transition to the next section, which is, um, uh, and it's really for entrepreneurs that might uh, be listening to us. Uh, if you want to go global, uh, which or at least regional or, or, or raise and get acquired from uh, an overseas uh, 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 partner, uh, the question is how to, to go global, right? How do you expand uh, overseas? Uh, how do you access global capital source? How do you find your potential exit outside of the region, right? So on, on that topic, and I think uh, I would love to start with, with uh, Stas on that. I think uh, you have, um, uh, for example, raised uh, you know, uh, a large round last year to uh, fuel your uh, global expansion. Um, tell us more about that and also, you know, um, how you are uh, now uh, using this uh, fresh capital to even accelerate your international uh, sales and expansion. Yes, indeed. Well, last year we had uh, a round led by Goldman Sachs and it was about 150 US million uh, and it made us a uh, unicorn finally and uh, but basically it's not like the first round we did and essentially yes uh, for, there are uh, two main reasons why you raise the money one reason is basically you need to go globally you need money to open offices in your country you need to acquire your local partner or whatever at this stage we actually raise the money for a little bit different reason because we are in cyber protection, which is uh, connected to cybersecurity, and this is extremely hot space right now. We basically need to move faster to accelerate our technologies and uh, our product life. So essentially, we raise the money in order to be able to acquire uh, additional companies to improve uh, our products, to hire more engineers. Let me put it uh, that simply. And uh, it's an interesting way how you raise money when you <clears throat> go global. First of all, if you go global and you have presence in many countries, it helps you to talk to way more investors than you can do if you are just uh, residing in one specific country. Uh, for example, for Goldman Sachs, it was uh, very important that a uh, large portion of our business, uh, roughly one third, of our revenue is coming from the United States. So they feel like uh, uh, we are pretty much in the, in the same country as there. And with, <clears throat> through all our history, we were talking to investors all the time. I mean, it never stops. First of all, good investor always talk to you. If you are a startup or business uh, looking for exit, they will talk to you anyway because this is their job, right? It doesn't mean that actually the investor you are talking to is going to invest in you. And there could be multiple reasons. Your business could be not so good. That's one reason. Uh, your investor simply do not understand your business. That's the most uh, common reason why people do not invest. If they simply could not understood it, uh, for they consider the risk to be too high and so on and so forth. One important thing I would uh, like to emphasize is that invest, investment is kind of like a marriage. So due diligence should be done on both sides because uh, uh, probably you don't want to have an investor who do not understand your business, who gave you money and who got a board seat and can block your decisions, but basically they could not bring additional value. Uh, many uh, top uh, tier one investors, uh, they definitely have a lot of uh, value to offer to you, but you still need to understand what they are going to do 
when they will invest, when they will be on your board, and uh, when they actually uh, run business together with you. Great. Uh, maybe we can uh, ask uh, Eric on this. I mean, uh, you have raised quite a lot of capital as well, expanding many countries. Tell us more about how you did it. Uh, did you uh, did you use like third party like a uh, advisors, bankers? Um, did you use like sales agent or partners on the ground for some uh, countries where you didn't have a, a team? I would love to uh, get your perspective on that. Yeah, you, you are asking about you know going global for uh, finding investors. So when I was looking for money for transfer to, so when I reached the uh, you know the beginning of attraction, so I did a one million seed round uh, uh, from you know people who who mostly made money from my previous um, startup. Uh, so, so the seed round was pretty easy. What has been more difficult is, uh, and that was 2009. Uh, once we reached traction, you know, we've proven the model. We had like, um, you know, a couple of millions of dollars of uh, of, of TPV uh, going through the uh, through the system. Um, but you know, 2009, just after the financial crisis and headquarter in Singapore, the ecosystem uh, when it comes to uh, VCs and so on was just not there. You know, Singapore has just changed so much over the last 10 years uh, when it comes to financing um, startups. Um, but, but back then I had no other choice than to uh, go abroad and go international. So I, I did both uh, uh, Sand Hill Road um, with, with you know, very, uh, you know, advanced discussions, but it was still tough for them. Uh, you know, the Silicon Valley investors are, 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 were back then have, have a hard time investing in a company uh, 12,000 uh, kilometers away from, uh, from where they were. Uh, so I ended up finding money in Europe um, and that's how I, I raised a, a 3 million Series A, uh, Series A round. So, I, I would have preferred to, to, to find money in, in Singapore. And I think now uh, for uh, the ecosystem here is, is way better. Uh, but, but back then I had, I had no, no choice. Um, uh, one thing uh, which, you know, which also would probably be different and also because maybe I'm now older. So I, I, I you know, uh, one of the reasons I was looking for money is, you know, yes, we were still uh, losing money, but I had a big working capital uh, requirement. And, uh, and so the more I was growing, the more uh, working capital I needed. And, and, and probably a mistake or something I should have explored better is to uh, finance through uh, bank loans or, or loans in general, rather than equity. Uh, and, and, you know, I you know, just to avoid uh, too much uh, dilution. And especially in, in 2009, I didn't have much uh, leverage on the valuation to be very, very honest. That's great. Uh, thanks for sharing this honest uh, feedback. Uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, Cameron uh, on that, uh, you know, how do you feel like how the, uh, you know, um, overseas investor or, your, or Intuit, you know, thought about the region here. Uh, did you have to go, you know, global to find uh, your investor or acquirer, or was there enough capital uh, here in Singapore? Right? Tell us more about that and how you did. Yeah. So we uh, we did, you know, both Singapore, Australia, and San Francisco roadshows over the years. Um, we got term sheets from the Valley. Um, those term sheets had um, the requirement for us to move to the states. Um, Impossible to say if that would have been a better or worse outcome for the business back at that stage. But um, I, you know, I think at the seed and Series A stage, very difficult for US investors even today uh, to invest in a Singapore-based company, especially probably more so today now that there is an ecosystem here. Um, I think for us, we found it quite easy to raise from Singapore, um, especially as when we started in say 2012, 2013, then the market was really getting going. The government was putting a lot of support into the ecosystem. There was a lot of investors looking to invest in the seed and Series A stage because of that government support. I actually think it's a bit harder today because I think a lot of the funds in Singapore are now focusing you know, almost purely on the region, especially at that early stage, or, and a lot of the funds have also moved up market. Um, so 
look, as I said, I think we uh, fundraising is never fun, never easy. I, I, as a first time entrepreneur, I, I know a few of the gentlemen here are second time entrepreneurs, so maybe it gets easier. Um, but uh, definitely, uh, it was always a bit of a drag. Um, but as I said, over time, we we kind of realized that um, uh, to really go raise the next big round of capital would have required us to go, you know, to the states, not just because of investors, but also because that was our biggest market, and it was hard to kind of tell a story that made sense about being headquartered in Singapore whilst raising, say, a big Series C, which would have been the next step if we hadn't uh, exited to, into it. Right. Uh, Olivier, same, same story. And I'm also curious, and this is a question for all of you, uh, especially when you thought about an exit, uh, since all of you, or at least three out of four of you, have exited uh, uh, your business in the recent uh, months or years. Um, did you thought about uh, early in the process how you're going to exit did you thought that would it be like a M&A transaction, a private uh, you know, trade sale, or is it going to be, for example, a public listing, direct listing? It could be like a SPAC, which is very popular these days. Uh, maybe Olivier, you can start, and you know, maybe Eric, you can continue on that. Uh, yes, so uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, yes, the, the exit strategy of a trade sale has been uh, a, a quite long process, not necessarily in terms of execution, but in terms of as you said, uh, organization. So uh, I raised overall not that much in the end, $10 million, because we didn't need that much capital for what we were doing or for our, our objective and ambition. Uh, it helped us to, to scale the business and become the leading player uh, in, in, in the region and attractive enough uh, to basically uh, be acquired by uh, another company outside of, of, of Asia. So my objective has always been the same, you know, building a strong uh, regional player, um, thinking that at some point there will be some consolidation in, in the space uh, I operate in, and uh, that would be valuable and uh, of interest for uh, any other player outside of the, of, of the same region. So uh, I would say you don't necessarily, you know, think of uh, the, the exit uh, at, during the early uh, stage of, of the company, but very quickly, uh, I would say halfway 2015, 16, between my series A and B, have been, you know, thinking of uh, what would be, you know, uh, the next steps uh, after, you know, those fundraising. Um, and uh, one of my key focus was, uh, of course, uh, building the business, the product, the team, making sure we had a scalable business and also a path to profitability. So we've all, always, or more or less, always been profitable up to, uh, I would say, the Series A, invested, um, became profitable again just before the Series B invested again, and a year and a half ago, reach again, you know, a break even. So my thought is, or, or at least my key learnings are, if you build, you know, a very good product, you bring value to your customers, you can sell your product and have a good team, you're scaling your, your business and you have a path or you are profitable, a path to profitability or you're profitable. At some point, for sure, there will be a path to uh, an exit. Would it be an IPO, a trade sale? And now we've got all this pack. Um, basically, uh, um, happening. Uh, that was not necessarily the case, or that was not uh, that popular a year, a year, a year and a half ago. But um, to me, it was, it was also very important to build, you know, a, a strong leadership team. So very early on, I invested into a very strong leadership team, uh, a, a very good and strong CFO. I had two very good and strong COO who really helped me scaling the business up to the point where we were very well organized, structure in terms of you know process, tools, people uh, to sell the company. Um, and the last thing is uh, yes, we 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 I, I sold the company. Uh, uh, basically align uh, the board, uh, the shoulders. Uh, that was the right time for a lot of different reasons. We started to see some level of consolidation in the space. 
we knew we were um, in a good shape to get a quite good uh, valuation uh, that would be, you know, um, I would offer a very good, uh, you know, a reason for investors, uh, for uh, obviously myself, um, and decided to uh, appoint uh, an investment bank uh, um, uh, to help us going through this process because our objectives were to uh, find, you know, uh, a potential buyer uh, outside of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, so either, you know, China, Japan, or Europe, or the US. Uh, and the best way to achieve this uh, was to go uh, with, a, with a bank, even if uh, we had been approached by different players. But one of my overlearning is that uh, when you initiate ad hoc discussion with one potential buyer, you're not necessarily in the best position or in a strong position with a lot of leverage uh, to uh, basically uh, um, get the exit, get to the exit, and, and, and have pressure uh, on the deal and have a calendar with different milestones. It yeah, makes sense. Uh, uh, thanks for sharing that. Uh, Eric, me, I know you have some uh, experience too. You looked at uh, the various uh, public exchange, you know, sold to public listed companies, and you also have. Uh, you know, uh, recently I've been, uh, uh, you know, looking at SPACs. Do you share a bit about, about this other type of exit? Uh, maybe some of the, you know, uh, viewers and entrepreneurs uh, watching us would be interested to, uh, to understand more what are all the options on the table. Yeah, yeah, I think that's an interesting, interesting topic. Uh, you know, I at, at some point in Transfer 2, we looked at the option of, of getting listed on, you know, smaller exchanges, uh, like regional exchanges, so either Singapore, Australia, and so on. But it, 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 you know, based on, on on the different examples we we've seen back then, it was not making so much uh, sense. Um, but nowadays, I would think that, especially through this uh, SPAC uh, process, I, I believe you know if you're reaching a valuation in the 150 200 million uh, range it starts to be a, a very possible um, uh, exit opportunity so if as a as a ceo as a founder you're here for the for, for the long term uh, and building your company for 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 long term i, I believe this is a very um, interesting uh, option and the great thing of being nasdaq listed is that you're getting a very big liquidity that you're not going to get anywhere else uh, on on any other market uh, around the world. So, so, so that's something which is you know a, a real possibility. It really depends on where you are in your uh, entrepreneurship uh, and and from a personal standpoint. Uh, you know, even though we we sold the company for hundred million uh, the first time, you know, we were so heavily diluted that we you know the founders we. We end up still having to continue to work for the for the rest of our life. So um, you know it's not the same thing where you know one of the thing you want to be when you are I don't know around forty uh, years old is to have enough money in the bank. You want to cash out uh, enough so that you know you can uh, continue and focus on uh, about the future. So uh, so so that's the kind of process uh, you need to be able to manage your your personal finance, but. But if you want to grow your company uh, for years and years, uh, public markets are, are really an, uh, something interesting. That's great. I think that's a, a great transition to our last section and, and the, the conclusion, which is, uh, uh, you know, if you had to give one advice to founders that want to go global, you know, for aspiring founder, you know, if there is, uh, you know, any uh, interesting story you would like to share or, you know, or, for example, we can, I can start with Stas here. Uh, if you want to share more about, you know, uh, what are all the aspiration and changes going forward in the next couple of years for you, uh, how you're going to continue the global expansion, have you thought about an exit? And looking back at the, the journey, what would you um, share to uh, uh, aspiring uh, founders that want to uh, follow your path. Yeah, thank you. And it's a nice uh, transition from the previous uh, uh, speaker. I personally think that unless it's a family business, which you want to run forever, you're kind of uh, have to think about exit. I mean, you, you don't need to think about M&A or IPO, 
because uh, those are details and you decide when the time comes uh, depending on the value which you can get from IPO or M&A deal uh, for your shareholders, for your uh, for friends, uh, colleagues and um, employees. Every company actually always think about the exit and when a board uh, and founders are in agreement on timeline, then basically just a technical detail whether it's going to be an IPO or MMA, depending on the state of your business, of course. But what I think uh, we will see in 2021, first of all, uh, I believe the economy will start recovering everywhere in Asia faster than in other countries uh, because Asia actually is dealing better this COVID uh, situation than uh, Europe or the United States. But even in Europe and the United States, I think uh, vaccination will be available for everyone, uh, for at least in the first half of uh, next year. I think maybe even in Q1. And that will lead to the situation that uh, actually starting a new business, searching for investment uh, would become way easier than it's now. First of all, because governments all over the world, they injected enormous amount of money into the economy to support them uh, during pandemic. Uh, for example, Singapore invested almost uh, 70 billion US dollars into the economy to support uh, local uh, companies. And for Singapore, it's close to 20% of GDP. So definitely not all countries invested that huge amount of money, but still everybody was spending money. And now when the situation will start becoming better, all those money uh, will somehow be available for uh, starting and building and expanding new business. And as such, going global next year makes perfect sense. And one thing I would uh, keep in mind while going uh, for global is that right now, pretty much all the countries are passing the law on uh, data protection and privacy, like GDPR in Europe, like uh, personal data here in Singapore. And that actually, uh, you better to be familiar with if you want to go global, because uh, significant and dealing with it is not trivial. For example, Acronis is going to open additional data centers. Right now, we have uh, data centers in uh, 17 places in the world. For next year, we are planning to expand it uh, to more than 100. And uh, the primary reason is that, first of all, uh, governments are requiring you to keep citizens' data in the same country. And second, actually businesses and people are concerned as well where you keep their day. It's kind of uh, one advice, uh, what not to forget if you're going global next year. Great, uh, thanks, that's, that's a great uh, perspective and congratulations for the, the very, very rapid uh, expansions. Um, Cameron, uh, tell us more about, you know, same, if you have an advice to give to uh, a funny story to share anything, uh, any plans for 2021 and, and, and beyond, let us know. Yeah. I think um, I would just like to share something that I think I both learned through the MNA process and I'm learning even more thoroughly being inside a large corporate, which is um, a company like Intuit quite clearly um, shares its goals on its quarterly and annual um, investor relations calls. It kind of talks about where they're going, what they're trying to do. And um, I guess what I'm learning, and, and, and I'd be curious to hear from the others, Olivia, you know, Eric, et cetera, um, if this was the case, but actually with a company like Intuit, and I'm sure it's the same with Google and Facebook and Amazon, the the decision to buy a company can quite often come from a director, or even a manager level. It doesn't necessarily come from the CEO. And um, what we saw is that um, Intuit had been looking at this problem um, for multiple years. They've been talking about wanting to solve this problem. We'd been partnering with them for many years. And it kind of got to a point where they said, look, it's time for us to buy a company to solve this problem instead of trying to solve it ourselves because we've realized we need those ex into those external expertise and now being inside into it i mean this is something that i'm sure everyone here knows but i hadn't quite understood how often 
these large companies with massive resources are trying to get things done. And it's just never as easy to do things in a large corporate as it is in a smaller startup. And so quite often, if you're a smaller company and you're working with your partners, if you can spend time to build relationships, to, to kind of really build those deep um, understandings of your partners, especially your larger partners, partners businesses, um, you can quite often start to get a picture of you know, where they're going and an understanding of when at some point they may decide um, that they would prefer to buy someone than build it themselves. The risk there, of course, is some companies uh, are more often, more often don't buy, they kind of, you know, if you partner closely with them, they may copy you, they may kind of um, commoditize your offering. Um, but I think that's been an interesting lesson to me because I've looked at Shopify, Amazon, Xero, Facebook, uh, all these platforms that we've partnered with over the years. And um, as I said, I think that's the biggest takeaway was that these large corporates, they have clear roadmaps that they talk about publicly as public companies. Um, and they have a lot of kind of people internally who have got to hit certain goals and certain KPIs. And it can be quite often, it can be very, um, can be very, make a lot of sense for them to buy instead of build. And so to build those relationships and to deeply understand the roadmaps of your biggest partners can be a great way to make sure you understand, um, you know, as if when your partners are looking to acquire. Great, thanks Cameron, great advice. Uh, I think uh, maybe Olivier, you share the same. Uh, we're only left with a couple of minutes, but uh, if, uh, if you would like to also share a bit more about yes. any interesting advice or how the, you know, same story about joining a bigger company, I think uh, that would be very mm. interesting. So for sure, I, I fully agree with what Cameron said. Uh, even if our experience has been a, a bit different because we were not partnering with the buyer, with Edbyte. So we had no business relationship with, uh, with, with Edbyte. But the thing is, uh, you're right, uh, most of the corporates, you know, they have a roadmap, they have their team, their process. And most of the time, it's easier to buy um, a, a third party rather than, you know, building in-house just uh, because you, you speed up the, the process and it's, 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 it's much faster. And obviously, as a startup, you are much much more agile, and you and, and you move uh, you move you move much much faster. So for us, um, I my vision was you know what we were building would be uh, potentially of interest for uh, some other uh, businesses uh, with potential synergies. Uh, so once again, when the cloud communication space and by is in the same space. Uh, but focusing on uh, more collaboration and contact center, uh, we were the missing piece to the product, and they had they had this roadmap in play. I mean, they had already built this roadmap, uh, and this was driven, you know, by the board, the CEO, the management team. Um, so they had started to build some capabilities uh, related to to our business, uh, but not big enough to really scale. So that was on their roadmap, uh, and then you know. Um, a, a, an exit, a trade sale, an M&A deal is always like uh, a wedding, actually. Uh, it's a marriage. So you need to, the timing needs to be good, the size, the culture, the geography, everything needs to come together. Uh, so it's hard to find, you know, um, the perfect fit, the, 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 the perfect match. So reason sometimes you need a third party, like an investment bank um, to uh, match, basically, to... <laughs> third party with uh, a roadmap, an, an agenda, and make this happen. Uh, one of the key learning to me is always the same um, for uh, the uh, founders and entrepreneurs. Uh, before, and that was my, my experience, before going global or even regional, make sure you become, or you can build something where you can be the leader of something. So if you are, if you are either the leader uh, in your uh, you know, industry with certain products, uh, you are a leader among a certain, you know, um, uh, customer base or industry, or you are a leader uh, in, in, into a, a specific geography, a country or a region before. So that was my, my experience. Try to become at least a leading player into your geography before you expand. So we've been expanding uh, in Southeast Asia step by step, country by country, uh, by, you know, trying to take you know a leadership at least in a region before we could be uh, you know uh, acquired or we could expand globally so that, that, that has been my learning great learning great learning it's since we're running out of time eric if you have a last uh, short sentence something positive to share to everyone for 2021 and then we can uh, wrap it up well, i was about to say something not very positive but not for, uh, okay. but more more in the past and if i can ask a question to to cameron and and, and, and olivier uh, 
you know, did you feel a bit like me when I sold the company um, for the first time? I felt like shit, and I, like I, I sold my baby. Um, is it only me, or did you have the same? I definitely have those feelings from time to time. Uh, not that I sold my baby, but that I lost my platform. Or I lost, like, you know, this idea of find your vehicle and drive it. I feel like I sold my vehicle. And, um, but I think to Stouse's point before, I'd made commitments to shareholders, to my employees, to my customers to build and continue to grow a product that can serve them and that can do the best that we can possibly do. Um, and it was a great outcome for myself, my brother, our investors, our shareholders, for our employees, for our customers. But um, definitely feel like I, uh, you know, I sold my my perfect platform vehicle. But um, I made that decision years ago when I first raised capital and made that commitment. Um, and so I think, as we discussed, we'd probably do things differently. Uh, I'm sure the second time founders here are doing things differently. But uh, definitely felt a bit of that. Still feel that. You know, it's been 12 weeks. <laughs> it's definitely something I think about a lot. Right, uh, Olivier. In 30 seconds. Uh... Yes and no. The thing is. Uh... I had been, you know, mentally prepared to sell my business. Uh, what was key for me is to make sure that everybody, everybody was going to be happy. Our, our employees, our shoulders, uh, my co-founders. I wanted to make sure that we would bring, you know, value to all of them and to the buyer. Uh, and we've been uh, quite lucky to, um, let's say, uh, the company admit that acquired us, left us probably a bit more independent of the first few months. Uh, before going through, you know, a deep uh, integration, and we're still working on the integration, phase by phase, step by step. Uh, it starts with the people, uh, the business, the technology, and then the tools and the process. So we're going through this transition. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I was prepared. So yes, you lose some uh, level of control, of course, of your business, of everything, of your freedom, well, because you become at some point uh, a kind of you know, uh, employee, uh, but in the same time, uh, I mean, that's your first exit, you, you, you cash out, uh, it brings you also some financial freedom. Um, so you need to take everything into account uh, and you know that there, there, there will be another life or two or three other different lives in the future. Uh, and you can do, you know, what we do, what, what we call rinse and repeat. This is something you can do, you can do better or differently. Uh, so it opened a lot of perspective. Great. I think that's, if I can summarize here and as a conclusion, what you are uh, all saying is that uh, somewhere in uh, every negative, there is a positive, like uh, going global out of Singapore is difficult, uh, but you're all here, uh, the living proof that we it's, it's feasible. It's sometimes difficult uh, and it's challenge to educate overseas partners, overseas investors or potential acquirers about, you know, Southeast Asia and about, you know, uh, investing in this region. Uh, but overall, you know, it seems like everybody from the founder, the employees, the shareholder, and of course, Singapore region are really benefiting by all uh, having great entrepreneurs like uh, the four of you uh, going uh, global. So in that, I would like to thank uh, uh, all of you, Stas, uh, Rick, Olivier, and Cameron for your time today. I would also to thank uh, MS and the FinTech Festival for organizing. Um, and I wish all of you uh, great and hopefully very safe and productive uh, 2021. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Jean-Claude and the panel of Southeast Asian company founders.